welcome to season 7 of 2000's Childhood Pop. My name is Mr. 96. After six seasons of this show, I have to apologize for the latter half, as the last three seasons have only produced two episodes each. This year, I definitely plan to release more than two episodes, so let's start off strong by looking back at one of the biggest hits of the decade. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, Low by Flo Rida featuring T-Pain was not only the biggest hit of 2008, but one of the most influential songs in pop music history. For my younger audience who either wasn't born yet or was too young to remember, you don't understand just how big this was. This song was suggested to me by Maddie on Patreon. If you want to know how to suggest 2,000 songs for me to review, stay tuned until the end of the video. But you heard me right, I said this was one of the most influential songs in pop music history. It wasn't just any old number one hit that caught on to the big trends of the time. This song started trends that would continue into the next decade. Low became the first ever song to sell 4 million digital copies, as well as the first to reach 5 million. On Billboard's decade end charts for the 2000s, this song was at number 3, only behind We Belong Together and Yeah. Growing up, I didn't hear We Belong Together or Yeah until the 2010, so as far as commercial success goes, this is probably the biggest song I'll ever cover on this show. At first, I thought this was going to be a short episode, but in writing this script, I ended up going down a deep rabbit hole that kept me occupied for weeks. Usually I'd start with the background of the artist, but today I'm actually going to get straight into the song analysis. I know this is pretty unconventional for those of you who followed me for a while, but trust me, there's a point to this. So let's start from the very beginning. The moment the song starts, it immediately catches you with its crunk-like instrumental and some tight synth work. The beat is produced by a man named DJ Monte, who previously made the 0607 hit Walk It Out by Unk. You can tell the instrumental has a lot of similarities to Low. Somehow I didn't realize the similarities until doing research for this episode, which is pathetic on my part because I heard this song all the time whenever a group got eliminated on America's Best Dance Crew. Actually, DJ Monte mentioned that when he made the beat to Low, the first people to use that beat were Paul Wall and Juvenile, but Paul didn't want to release the track, so the label instead gave the beat to some nobody named Flo Rida. Well, sucks to be Paul Wall, because he jumpstarted Flo Rida's entire career by indirectly giving him a song that would be more successful than Paul Wall's entire catalog combined. But with that killer instrumental, we get to the opening hook by T-Pain. The hook of a generation as far as I'm concerned. For years as a kid, those lines were etched into my brain. Yet my sheltered ass never actually knew what they meant. For a while, I thought apple bottom jeans was just a slang term for booty jean shorts, or jorts as they call them. But it turns out it's referencing an actual line of jeans started by Nelly of all people. But as iconic as the line about said jeans and the boots with the fur is, one part about the chorus that stands out is the second half. The first thing I noted was that she turned around and smacked her ass for seduction. Personally, I always interpreted that as her turning around, bending for a dip, and slapping the booty, but maybe that was just my teenage brain speaking. But more importantly, one thing I didn't catch was that T-Pain now states a completely different set of clothing from what he said earlier. How can she be wearing jeans, boots, sweatpants, and Reeboks at the same time? Is she a seductive centaur lady getting it multiple ways? Well, someone actually thought that five years ago, so T-Pain clarified that the apple-bottom jeans describes Flo Rida's kind of woman, while the baggy sweatpants describe T-Pain's lady. A working class type, I presume. But regardless of what kind of girl gets him hard, T-Pain absolutely sells the club vibe like his life depends on it. It's the kind of song that gets any group of people going, and its effect was felt almost immediately. In fact, one relatively forgotten fact about Low is that during its 10-week run at the top of the charts, it was actually performed live in the first episode of ABDC. <laughs> Yeah, Flo Rida showed up and performed it for the sudden death battle between the bottom two crews. Facing elimination, both Enigma Dance Crew and Iconic would compete in an intense display of dancing prowess. I'm kidding, the battle itself was incredibly underwhelming as neither of the crews were any good. 
You'd think a live music performance would be remembered more in ABDC history, but no one talks about this because the dances had no energy or tight choreography. Hell, the camera mostly focused on Flo Rida's personal dancer, who was way better than both of the crews. Also, I don't have much love for the crew Iconic, because they ended up spawning Iconic Boys in Season 6. Don't get me wrong, they were immensely talented, way more talented than I'll ever be, but they shouldn't have made the top two. Thank God I Am Me won, because they were so obviously better that not even MTV could rig it against them. I apologize for the tangent. ABDC gets me very heated. I can't promise it won't come up again. Anyways, Lo is a bop with an all-time hook, and Flo Rida himself lives up to his name by demonstrating said name is former. Personally, I'd go as far as to say that these verses are arguably my favorite among his songs. He generally goes with whatever beat he has in his tracks, and with this southern bass and synth, he demonstrates that he's the man of the party. Back in the 2000s, it was common to censor every swear or reference to stuff like weed if you want to get on MTV, but one part I'm shocked was kept in is this. So lucky on me, I was just like a clover. Shorty was hot like a toaster. Sorry, but I had to fold her. Like a pornography poster, she showed her. I was in sixth grade when this came out, so I'm shocked I didn't catch that line back then. In fact, I don't think I caught it until pretty recently. Why is that? Well, part of it is that Flo Rida tends to be all flow without the lyrical tact of his peers. Okay, that's being unfair to him, a lot of rappers in the 2000s barely tried with their lyrics, but still, they were rap stars before they were pop stars. Just listening to Flo Rida, you wouldn't guess that he got his start being associated with Rick Ross of all people. And yeah, Rick Ross ain't a lyrical mastermind by any stretch, but Rick Ross has something that Flo Rida doesn't, and it's the thing that's always held the ladder back. A personality. So remember when I said I want to start the song analysis early? The reason is that it's honestly the part of this video I have the least to say, and that's mostly because of the lead artist. With every one of Flo Rida's songs, people rarely talk about his performance or what makes him stand out. This dude had some of the biggest hits of his era, yet 90% of you would probably ask, Who the fuck is Flo Rida, man? Thank you, DJ Monte. So when I knew I was going to review this song, I ended up going through tons of research just to understand the Flo Rida phenomenon, and looking back, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Flo is great, easily Flo Rida's best song, but it's great in a sense that everyone recognizes it but doesn't have more to say. Actually, I do have more to say, but it's less about Lo and more about the legacy of Lo. Flo Rida may not be many things, but one thing we have to accept, whether we want to or not, is that he was influential. The entire arc of late 2000s pop drastically changed when Low became a hit. Without it, we wouldn't have 2009, 2010, 2011, and even 2012 to an extent, most of which were dominant Flo Rida years. Yet despite that, Flo Rida himself has never been viewed as a cultural icon in the same way we view other acts from that time, like Gaga, Drake, Kanye, Taylor, or even goddamn Pitbull. Just like in my Linkin Park episode last time, I like looking at how music affected trends and vice versa, so I want to figure out if Flo Rida was actually as good as his commercial success dictates, or if he was just in the right place at the right time. I've mentioned in the past that I'm not much of an album listener, but then again, Flo Rida wasn't much of an album guy either, so let's look at some of his other singles after Low. <laughs> His second single was a song called Elevator. I personally remember this song because Supreme Soul, the only Bay Area crew on ABDC, performed to this song in season two. Two things. One, yes, this is basically the same beat from Four Minutes by Madonna and Justin Timberlake from the same year. I guess Timbaland knew he had a great beat and wanted to get his money's worth out of it. Two, Flo Rida saying she's stuck on my elevator means exactly what you think it means. Still, I have a lot of affection for this song. But also in 2008, he had another single that I'm sure more of you will remember. Oh my this is my jam. Just like Low, this was also a big hit, but personally, I discovered it because of the Niga Higa parody, The Ninja Glare. Now we're really getting into the nostalgia part of this show. 
I could mention how this song was also performed on ABDC by Most Wanted Crew, but almost every Flo Rida hit was performed on ABDC, so we'd be here forever. Hell, this video is literally from Flo Rida Week in Season 7. Most Wanted should have won that season, by the way. But 2009 would be another big year for the Florida Man with his album Roots, which stands for Route of Overcoming the Struggle. Kind of strange to use the imagery of Roots to represent an album full of pop rap songs, but hey, you do you, man. Of course, I'm sure many of you remember this song from 2009. Like Low, it also made it to number one on the charts. It's nowhere near as good as the original You Spin Me Round, but I've always had a soft spot for Flo Rida's version as well. You spin my head right round, right round. In addition, we wouldn't find out until after the fact that the uncredited woman on the chorus was actually Kesha before her official debut later that year. Unfortunately, this wouldn't be the last time Dr. Luke committed terrible actions to Kesha, but at the very least, Flo Rida is giving credit to her on the actual YouTube video years after the fact. Regardless, Flo Rida would end up having another hit song in 2009, and you might recognize the melody to this one. That's right, Flo Rida wasn't done sampling classic songs, as he would sample the one and only Blue Daba D. For myself, I've always loved Blue Daba D, and Flo Rida's version has a strange soft spot in my heart. If you thought David Guetta and BB Rexa were the only ones to sample this song, nah, it's been sampled and interpolated many times, but Flo Rida was first. The original song will always be the best version, but as far as cover versions go, this might be a hot take, but I think Flo Rida's version is better than David Guetta's. My lips like sugar. My lips Yes, Sugar is dated late 2000s electropop, and yes, it uses candy sex metaphors, which are one of my pet peeves, but if you ask me, I think that fits the spirit of the original song. The original Blue is ridiculous nonsense that is completely ambiguous. Because of course it is. In the Vice documentary about Blue Daba D, Jeffrey J of Eiffel 65 says he chose the word blue partly because everyone could interpret it however you wanted, and their producer suggested the Daba D part as intentional nonsense that didn't require language to understand, or misunderstand. So saying Flo Rida's interpolation is tasteless isn't much of a criticism considering that's sort of the point. When I was a kid, I distinctly remembered this line because other kids in my 7th grade English class laughed at it. For the last 14 years, I thought Sprung was talking about Flo Rida's raging boner, but apparently it's just African American vernacular for being in love. But honestly, I don't think I was far off. And for all intents and purposes, that was the end of the 2000s. I would say Flo Rida had a pretty damn good two years in the spotlight. But if you thought that would be the peak of his career, you haven't seen the rest of it. At the start of the new decade, the club boom was real. TikTok by Kesha was the song that dominated the year, but when I think of pop music in 2010, the first song that comes to mind is this. Two of the most influential figures of late 2000s, early 2010s music came together, Flo Rida and David Guetta. While this song only peaked at number 9, its electropop sound was emblematic of the times. Like with Low being in Step Up 2, Club Can't Handle Me was in another Step Up movie, Step Up 3D, which... Did we really need a teen romance dance movie to be in 3D? I forgot how much Hollywood force-fed 3D after James Cameron's Avatar. I only saw clips of that movie, but I distinctly remember a dance battle that involved the song Beggin' by Madcon. I was b-boying at the time, so I really liked Beggin' by Madcon after seeing Quest Crew and Beat Freaks perform it in ABDC. God damn it! It always comes back to ABDC. Welcome to my teenage years. Anyways, that was Flo Rida's only hit in 2010. It's not one I go back to, but it's the symbol of the early 2010s for me. His most notable song in 2011 was the David Guetta hit with Nicki Minaj, Where Them Girls At, in which he was a guest feature. But in the latter half of 2011, he would start a string of hits that would dominate the next year. Oh, sometimes I get a good feeling, yeah. 
First off, we have Good Feeling. You might recognize it as it samples the song Levels by the late Avicii, and that song samples Something's Got a Hold on Me by Etta James. Now, I've seen people who hate Good Feeling as they think it's a massively inferior song to Avicii's. I do agree that Levels is way better and is one of the best EDM songs of the decade, and considering Good Feeling was the one that got attention while also being produced by Dr. Luke, I'm tempted to feel negative towards Flo Rida's version. But honestly, I always thought it was pretty good. That Etta James sample was a fantastic find by Avicii, and I think Flo Rida's flow is really solid in the verses. Also, I've gotten used to it as the victory theme for whenever the Warriors win at home, so I'm a bit biased as well as lucky for seeing four championships in eight years. That song would dominate throughout 2012, and once that year began, his next three singles would all become hits. Of course, we had Wild Ones with Sia, which was everywhere in 2012. I like this one, and I'm glad he still loves performing it despite Sia completely embarrassing herself in the years since. But afterwards, we also had Whistle. It's his only other song besides Low and Right Round to reach number one on the Hot 100, which amazes me because honestly, I'm not a fan. Can you blow my whistle, baby? Whistle, baby, let me know. For one, Blow My Whistle is not clever. It means one thing and only one thing because it's not even a double entendre. At most, it's a single and a half entendre. Seriously, if you took it as her blowing his literal whistle, why the fuck would he own a whistle? Is he a youth football coach? Even if he is, why would she blow it anyway? Hopefully not for the reason in Canadian PSAs. What is that? It's a rape whistle. I've heard that another interpretation could be that whistling refers to catcalling, but catcalling is done by men to women, so why would she be catcalling him when he's the one asking her to lick his ding-dong? I know this sounds rich coming from the guy who defends sugar, but my main problem with whistle isn't that it's gross or tasteless. No, the issue is that it makes no sense in what is ultimately a bland, breezy tune. For one, the verses are even more filler than the usual flow ride of filler. The tempo is on the moderate side, and the music rarely ever changes its pattern or dynamics, leaving him no opportunity to say anything interesting in this supposed sex song that isn't all that sexy. Strangely enough, I also question the functionality of the sex involved. Girl, I'm gonna show you how to do it and we start real slow. You just put your lips together Put your lips together feels pretty contradictory to how blowjobs work. Normally, you'd want her mouth open so that she can move more easily, so I'm not sure how this mouth formation is supposed to get the job done. You know, unless you're looking for a squeezer type of girl, which I don't even know if that's a thing, but hey, I ain't judging. But honestly, that part is pretty minor in terms of my gripes. Here's where I really have to ask questions. Go on, girl, you can twerk it. Let me see you whistle while you work it. Wait a minute, she can't be doing actual whistling because we've already established she has no reason to. So if she's blowing your whistle, why would you want her to do so while she's twerking? Also, is that even physically possible? If she's shaking her head and ass at the same time, I don't think that would be comfortable for her or you for that matter. So I hope this is safe and consensual. Then again, the Sugar music video implies a woman had non-consensual sex with him while he was unconscious, so if that's what Flo is into, I'm starting to think that Canadian whistle was onto something. Mr. 96, it is quite simple. You simply shake it back and down, back and down, back and down, back and down. Okay, I think I get it. Maybe. Anyways, his next single, I Cry, was released in late 2012 and became a big hit in 2013. It's a bit different from his previous songs in that he tries to go for more emotion, but coincidentally enough, this would parallel the beginning of the end of the Flo Rida era, so to speak. 2013 was when the decade really started to find its identity, as Flo Rida's brand of clubbing and partying was no longer in style. You can thank Lord and Miley Cyrus for that, for better or worse. That's not to say Flo Rida didn't have more hit songs after 2013. His momentum may have slowed down, but his career wasn't going to die that easily. In 2015, he had GDFR, which had less pop sheen on it, as he had to change with the times, but I remember it being big, as it was a top 10 hit. In 2016, he had My House, which was more classic Flo Rida, and was a top 5 hit, but that's where his hit-making days would end. In hindsight, 2016 was a transition year for pop, because 2017 was when the late 2010s truly began. 
Raindrops, drip, drop top, drop top, smoking no cooking the hot box. Cookies. Streaming became the primary way to consume music, so trap had taken over completely as the dominant genre. Even for those who did produce pop, unless you were an A-lister, you had to evolve to the more low-key and melancholic vibe of the late 2010s. While Flo Rida has released one-off songs during that time, he hasn't released an album or EP since 2015, and I'm not surprised. Todd the Shadows has talked about how he believes there are two types of superstars. There are those who are inherently compelling to where they'll always have a diehard fanbase, and there are those whose relevance will disappear once the hits stop coming or being any good. Flo Rida is absolutely the latter, but then again, did he ever have a real fanbase to begin with? Flo Rida was never considered a legit MC to whom you'd gravitate towards for his lyrics. He had good flow, as indicated by his name, but he was always just the guy who had the catchy pop hooks, most of which he didn't even sing. That's not to say pop rappers can't have a fan base or following. MC Hammer was a major cultural icon, and the Black Eyed Peas were huge throughout the 2000s and were the largest beneficiary of the Flo Rida boom in 2009. But there's a major difference there. You can cosplay as MC Hammer. You can perform parodies of the Black Eyed Peas. What is Flo Rida's unique trait? I've never heard of a Flo Rida stan. Well, except this guy, apparently. My name's John. I'm from Bridesburg. I, I've been waiting for a Flo Rida concert this entire pandemic. I knew the pandemic would be over when Flo Rida took the stage. I'm ready. Are you guys ready? Hit like and subscribe. Flo Rida's coming. Yeah! Huh, that's neat. But that man aside, there's nothing about Flo Rida himself that makes him stand out in a crowd. Hell, when I was a kid, the first thing I noticed about him was that his name was a pun for Florida, and since he had women sing in some of his hooks, I thought he should have been called Flo Rida and the Florida Girls. I was not a funny kid, so I apologize for the lame joke, but that just goes to show that even when I did listen to his songs, I couldn't find anything unique about him. The main reason I say Lo was his best individual performance is because it had the vibe of yesterday's crunk while also mixing in the synths that would define the club boom to come. It gave some literal bass for him to vibe with, which sonically grounded him and gave him more substance than he actually has. It was always the song before the artist. Hell, back when I had an mp3 player, one song I listened to often was his 2009 single Be On You with Neo. And if you don't like that, listen it right back, but I just got the song never got a music video, so when I look back at why I liked that song when I was 13, it was mostly because of Neo's hook rather than Flo Rida's verses. That's not to say Flo Rida had no talent, I did like a lot of those songs at the time, and he has such a large catalog of hits that clubs and parties to this day will often play one of them. But Flo Rida was a singles artist. Lo was certified diamond, but his album sales never even reached gold in the US, which explains why he never maintained a loyal following after his prime. With that being said, I'd say his career was a massive success. Maybe he doesn't have the intensely loyal following of most MCs, but his songs are still beloved to this day, and he changed the trajectory of popular music in the late 2000s and early 2010s. And for all the talk of him being a pop star nobody cares about, he managed to stay relevant on the charts for nearly a decade. The fact that Flo Rida had a hit song in 2016 is enough evidence to say he did pretty well. I've listened to some of his singles after my house, and there's this one where he tries to do more of a triplet flow with trap production, and honestly, he's got a decent handle on it. But when we think of the man, we think of his catchy pop hooks, and he knows that as well. He often does nostalgia shows nowadays whenever he can, but as far as I'm concerned, that's a pretty damn good legacy to have. He may not be the most captivating celebrity in the world, but I don't think anyone would be disappointed to have the career he had. He's like a one-hit wonder who managed to stretch his gimmick into about a dozen hits. And even if you're not the biggest fan of his music, Lo still kicks ass and gets people moving to this day. I wouldn't want to live in a world where this song didn't exist, so in that regard, Flo Rida's place in history is secure. Next thing you know, son, I got no, 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 no. Once again, I want to thank Maddie for suggesting this song, as this ended up being an extensive video. I only hope I did well enough. 
If you all enjoyed this episode, I want you to leave a comment and say thank you, Maddie, for the centaur ladies and the jorts. If you also want to suggest 2,000 songs for me to review, you can join my wonderful patrons on Patreon. For just $1 per video, you can join my patron-only Discord server where we chat and chill, and at $2 per video, you get to vote on what songs I review for my series 2000s Childhood Pop. At $5 per video, you get to be listed in my names of fame, and at $10 per video, you get a personal shout to the heart, along with Casey Volante, Jason Semler, and Prideful Zella. For my patrons watching this around release, you can click the link below to help vote on what song I'll review for the next patron-voted 2000s Childhood Pop episode. Once again, I'm Mr. 96. If you want to see more pop reviews, click the subscribe button below and tap that bell to be notified when I drop a new episode. This video was a massive blessing as I haven't gotten this deep into a song since my Sorry Sorry review. Pop songs may come in numbers, but there's only one. 96. 96.